Not too many people were expecting the leaders to transform the world. But there were some surprises. As we saw in the, in the Democracy Now! footage, the G20 protests were way bigger than we expected. Every event was bigger than we expected. Despite the intimidation, the home visits, the press conferences announcing new weapons, new weapons of the day, the walls, the fake laws, the fear. I mean, honestly, in my mind, and I'm sure in some of yours, it was a question whether anybody would show up in the week before. But they did. We did. Despite every effort of the police to scare us off and demobilize us and make sure that we thought that there was no point in showing up. And what people faced was a bit of a new era, a new beginning in policing. Over the last 10 years, I'm sure many of you know, there's been a transformation in the policing of protest, right? In part due to success of some activists. <coughs> Sometimes this is associated with the protests in Seattle against the World Trade Organization. Protesters successfully disrupted the summit, embarrassed the police, and this led to a drastic rethinking of what do we do around poli uh, protest policing. There's been a large-scale abandonment of the strategy of negotiated management, which had really existed since about the mid-1970s. Police were attempting to try and work with protesters in order to come up with um, an orderly expression of dissent. But increasing sections of the movement and movements didn't want to negotiate anymore. Right? There was a lot of feelings of irrelevance. We won more when we didn't negotiate, at least initially. So we see with that a shift towards more militarized policing. This is facilitated by the increasing power of private security and defense industry looking for new markets. You ever want a kind of a horrifying thing is go and look at the business plans for you know, uh, companies like Taser. It's a good time. And so we see uh, less lethal weapons, pepper spray, tasers, new batons, new shields, munitions, chemical, electrical, sound weapons being used against protesters. And we see an increasing militarization of protest in terms of military strategy, often looking at containment, right? We saw that in Toronto in terms of kettling, but an increased use of barricades, dividing the crowd, protest pens. Right? Sound familiar? And thirdly, an increased emphasis on intelligence gathering, use of new technologies, infiltration, and preemptive arrests. Now this new approach was really sort of solidified um, after the attacks uh, of the September 11th, 2001, which meant that anything could be justified, right? In the name of security. I could also say something more that I'm not going to right now around the use of immigration along these lines as well. Now, we saw this new era manifest itself in Toronto this past June at a summit where cost cutting and deficit reduction uh, was uh, celebrated Almost a billion dollars was spent on security and over a thousand people arrested, including community organizers, targeted for bringing movements together, including people rounded up in the streets, including those who tried to provide support for those in detention only to be attacked, and including people sleeping, people walking, people cycling. We saw this play out in Toronto this June as the people of Genoa, London, Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, have seen play out in their own cities. And I'm naming only the most similar cases. And as the people of Seoul will see in a couple months. Now some of this was new in Toronto, as the footage says, the tools, the integrated security unit, the secrecy, the scale. But of course some of it was not, right? Ordinary people sleeping, walking, cycling, hanging out have long been harassed and arrested. Ordinary people of color, young men, immigrants, poor people that is, right? But there is something significant happening here. 
Dissent is something that's increasingly criminalized. Opposition is seen as futile. And Harper and McGinty, even Miller and all of their opponents think they can get away with it, not all of their opponents. But then moments like these draw a line in the sand, don't they? They polarize a community, and what we've seen is that tons of ordinary people, people who hadn't mobilized for the G20, got angry and stood up to defend their city, their sense of right and wrong, their dignity, their spaces, their friends, and their co-workers. And now we're talking to each other, and we're organizing demonstrations and raising money and making the connections between land rights, immigration, policing, and prisons. Budget cuts and poverty. Even though it's August, and people are still recovering from their post-G20 burnout, and people are still under house arrest, and we still have $200,000 to raise. We've been transformed, and we're growing, and we're going to ensure that the arrogant decision of the G20 to keep on lining the pockets of their friends on the backs of the people and the planet <coughs> will not be forgotten and we're going to see what a real new beginning might look like. Thank you.